Welcome to Electronic Materials. I'm Professor Rudy Schlaf at the Department of Electrical Engineering at the University of South Florida. This video will give an introduction and a brief overview over this course. Let me start out with trying to motivate why are we having a course about electronic materials. Why are electronic materials so important that we will spend one semester on understanding their basic workings? Well, I think the short answer to this is that electronic materials are one of the cornerstones of our current uh, lifestyle. All these cool things that you have around you, from modern cars to computers, iPhones, everything contains electronics. And electronics without semiconductors are very difficult to uh, build. So what you see here on this slide here, that is a historic moment reenacted actually in this picture. But it goes back to December 23rd, 1947, when John Bardeen, Walter Bratton and William Shockley uh, demonstrated the first transistor. And you may know that the transistor revolutionized uh, electronics because before they only had vacuum tubes. And vacuum tubes are of course big and they don't last very long and they also fail under mechanical stresses. But the transistor can be made really small and it's very stable because it is a solid state device. And um, only because of this here we have integrated circuits and uh, you can have your smartphones and laptops and self-driving cars and all that stuff. So let's have a look how this simple device incorporates electronic materials. Here you see all three material uh, classes represented that we have among the electronic materials, metals, semiconductors and insulators. And so metals and insulators, it's pretty obvious, they uh, either conduct current or they don't. And so they are being used to either uh, form electrodes or to keep things from getting into contact, like this piece of plastic here that separates the emitter and the collector electrode on this device. Now the important part here is the semiconductor, and that was in this experiment germanium. And so they used a germanium crystal and they changed its conductivity here by doping in the top layer and made it p-doped. We will learn in the uh, course uh, what all this means. But here for now, just bear with me, this enables this piece of germanium to change its conductivity dynamically depending on what voltage we apply between that base here and the emitter and the collector. And so by applying a voltage here, we can either suck the carriers out of the zone and make this area insulating here between the emitter and the collector, or we can push uh, carriers in here so to make it more metal like and so we get conductivity and with this we have a switch right we can simply change the voltage on the base relative to emitter and collector and then this here turns the current between emitter and collector on or off and so this here forms basically the uh, basis for all modern integrated uh, circuits that are used in your um, electronic gadgets and many other things Let's have a real quick look at what happened since 1947. You're probably all aware that uh, single transistors aren't being used that much anymore and that integrated circuits have become much more important. And so this development started in 1970 when Intel came out with the first commercially available integrated circuit called the Intel 4004. And that started a development where these uh, devices became ever more powerful. You see, this first one here, the 4004, had 2000 transistors and it was able to run at 740 kilohertz clock frequency. And now, here close to 2020 on this, on this graph, we have about 10 to 20 billion transistors in one of those devices and the clock frequency is uh, 2 to 3 gigahertz. The reason for that is that when things get smaller, then um, they also can be faster because essentially fewer electrons have to be moved around and over shorter distances and so all this uh, can work at a much higher clock frequency. This is called Moore's Law, you probably knew that. 
And you also see here that this curve, which uh, for a long time sort of followed twice the number of transistors every two years uh, on a certain uh, a, a die area, now it has to it has started to taper off a little bit. So the progress has become slower, and the reason for that is that these devices have become so small that um, a, a transistor gate. Uh, for example, only contains a handful of atoms, and you can imagine that this gets pretty difficult to control, especially if you want to make 10 to 20 billion of them in one piece of silicone, and you expect that all of them work. All right, now that you're all super motivated to take this class, let's uh, jump right in here and summarize the uh, basic properties of the three um, electronic materials classes that I just introduced. So let's start over here with the insulators. Insulators, they are essentially characterized by the fact that they don't have free electrons in them. So all electrons participate in chemical bonds and they cannot move around and that's why we cannot pass a, a current through insulators. So that makes them really great for uh, keeping things separate um, between uh, uh, areas that are conductive. With having no free electrons comes along that the heat conductivity is also very poor because heat conductivity has a lot to do with having um, uh, free electrons or it depends on how many free electrons there are in a material. So this poor heat conductivity of course makes insulators great as uh, insulators that keep um, hot bodies hot and cold bodies cold. What are the applications? Well of course insulating between conductors and heat insulation. Um, when it comes to materials, well, there are plastics, right? You have them around uh, wires as insulation. Glass is a really good insulator. Uh, a silicon oxide is the insulator of choice in many integrated circuits, although over uh, recent years or maybe decade even, um, other materials, other oxides have become more popular for various reasons. So oxides often are, are insulators. So let's go over here to the metals, to the other end of the conductivity uh, range. Metals have a free electron gas. That means there are many electrons in there. They can move about freely throughout the uh, material and that is the foundation for the uh, high conductivity of metals. And with that comes along also an excellent heat conductivity. and so with this we have of course the applications of making electrical connections on an integrated circuit. These are called interconnects between all these transistors. Then heat sinks to get heat out of these devices. Power lines of course and uh, things like filaments where um, we need conductivity and also a bit of um, resilience when it comes to heat. So metals are really good at all of this. And so we have typical materials like uh, copper, aluminum, gold, filaments would be tungsten. Then there are also alloys that are conductive, bronze, which is copper alloys, and brass, which is uh, uh, a copper zinc alloy. So metals are good to uh, connect things and insulators are good to keep things apart. Now in between these two extremes we have semiconductors. And the very interesting thing about semiconductors is that we can tune the conductivity. And there are basically two ways to tune the conductivity. One is uh, one can design a semiconductor that has a certain level of conductivity. Uh, this is done by doping. And so here what you do is you put some uh, well-designed impurities into a bulk material like silicone or germanium and then um, the rates with which these uh, doping impurities are introduced, uh, the conductivity changes. Now once you have a piece of material with a certain conductivity, you can then use the field effect and by applying a voltage across the semiconductor material, you can then dynamically change the conductivity. And that's what we saw in this uh, transistor that I showed on the uh, first slide, right? By um, applying a voltage between gates and emitter and collector, uh, the transistor can change its conductivity uh, 
in its uh, center and with that the uh, current can be controlled and so that gives us switches that we can turn on and off at a high frequency so this is dynamic change of the conductivity and so this here is really at the heart of uh, our modern civilization that we have semiconductors and we can change their conductivity at will and very precisely and that gives us all these great devices like uh, switches and amplifiers and such so when we think of applications then we can kind of split them up into three areas digital right that's when the switch comes uh, into effect that gives us central processing units memory chips microcontrollers all that stuff uh, then analog that's sort of when we don't turn the current on and off just but we regulate it between zero and some maximum current smoothly and that gives us amplifiers and uh, sensors and things like that um, then we also have optical um, applications and I should have maybe added up here that uh, the third way to change the conductivity of a semiconductor is with light and so um, since semiconductors can also change their conductivity depending on the light that falls on them uh, we can make things like uh, solar cells and of course this also works the other way around uh, we can by applying a voltage to a semiconductor structure also emit light and that then uh, gives us light emitting diodes and semiconductor lasers also very important devices when it comes to data transmission and data storage and things like that so we think of materials then of course the most important one is and probably will always be silicon and um, you saw germanium was used for the first transistor these days germanium isn't so important anymore silicon is really the mainstay material and when it comes to uh, devices that need to be super fast or uh, interact with light then three uh, five materials are very popular there is gallium arsenide gallium nitride then there are also uh, two six materials and this refers to the periodic system right uh, column two and column six so here we have cadmium sulfide cadmium selenide these materials are for example interesting for um, solar cells so by end of the course um, what we will achieve is that you'll understand um, how insulators semiconductors and metals come about depending on the uh, atoms that they are uh, made from this here is our textbook for the course it's uh, SO CASAP principles of electronic materials and devices so the latest edition is the fourth and um, we will go through chapters one through five and, and chapter five that's when it finishes up by explaining um, semiconductors you can use older versions they can be much cheaper than the latest ones there aren't that many changes between them uh, but note that some of the sub chapters and problems and examples may have uh, slightly different numbers uh, compared to this fourth edition so the next few slides I want to use to um, discuss a little bit what each of the chapters of the book covers what we will learn there and so let's start out here with uh, chapter one so in the first part of chapter one we'll discuss essentially atoms and uh, uh, molecules and so we'll start out by uh, discussing the structure of atoms so we'll talk a little bit about the nucleus about the electron shells how electron shells are different in their energies uh, then we will start putting atoms together and discuss bonding so we will look at these bonding curves here and see that there is a a, a certain distance at which the energy is lowered the most and this is kind of this is the bonding radius between the atoms because atoms repulse each other a little bit because they have positive um, a, a positive nucleus and uh, they have negative electrons so depending on the distance there's a different behavior between repulsion and attraction and so this is how this uh, minimum comes about and this is why some some atoms like to stick together and form bonds and so we have four basic types of bonds ionic covalent metal and secondary bonding so we'll, we'll discuss this here a little bit 
Then we'll look in, into what they call kinetic molecular theory. So basically here now we look what do a bunch of atoms or molecules do that we put in a box and how connects their energy with the pressure and the volume and the temperature that we have that we can macroscopically measure uh, in this box. And from this we will derive the energy per degree of freedom per of these little particles in here. And I can tell you already very important formula here. This energy per degree of freedom is one half kT. So this is an important one. And um, from there then we'll go to the uh, energy distribution uh, in such an ensemble of particle as they as they say and with this we get the Boltzmann distribution that basically tells us the fraction of particles at a certain energy and this is also always a distribution like this but its maximum depends on the uh, temperature. So this is the first part of chapter 1. In the second part of chapter 1 we uh, put many atoms together and we look at uh, crystals or the solid state. And so we'll start out by discussing what kind of crystal structures and lattice types there are and then uh, in this context we'll uh, uh, look into how uh, crystal structures are being described and that takes us to the fascinating topic of Miller's indices that allow us to define um, lattice planes and directions in uh, lattices and then we'll look at uh, the uh, at defects because there are no perfect crystals in nature and so all crystals have some defects and there's a bunch of basic types of defects and so we will um, discuss them here they're also very important for that phenomenon of doping that I touched earlier P and N type doping in semiconductors is essentially introduction of um, defects in a very controlled way into a semiconductor. So we basically need to learn two things here. How can we make the material super pure and then how can we target it with certain impurities and adjust its conductivity. And so there we will learn, uh, we'll look a little bit into how to purify these materials. And, and look here at um, uh, zone refining. And in this context, it's very interesting to look at phase diagrams um, that allow us to um, understand these kind of processes. So at the end of chapter one, we'll um, be able to interpret uh, such phase diagrams. Moving on to uh, chapter two. In chapter two, we basically take these crystals from chapter one and we fill in electrons. And we have a look what happens to these electrons when we apply a uh, bias across this uh, crystal, a voltage. And we'll discover how these electrons then move through the crystal and how they scatter at defects and things like that. And that will allow us to do a classic treatment of electrical conductivity and we'll understand the uh, Drude model. Um, this will also give us then a dependence of the conductivity on temperature and defect density. So we'll look at curves like this here. Now once you have crystals uh, you want to characterize them and you want to see what the electronic properties are and for that we have the very important Hall effect. Here you see the Hall effect equation. This one will certainly uh, come up in, uh, in, uh, in one or two of the exams. Um, at the end of chapter two we'll uh, uh, check out what these electrons can do for thermal conduction and we'll see that basically thermal conduction and electrical conduction is very related. And so material with many electrons is also a good uh, thermal conductor. So by the end of uh, chapter two, we'll have an idea how crystals come about and we have a simple model for uh, conductivity in crystals. But what we cannot explain with these models are uh, semiconductors. And for that we need quantum mechanics. And so in chapter three, uh, basically we'll spend some time to study up on the basics of uh, quantum mechanics. And 
Um, at the end of chapter 3 we'll understand how atoms can be described with uh, quantum mechanical concepts. In chapter 4 and 5 then this will be expanded to uh, the solid state and then finally in chapter 5 to uh, semiconductors. So in chapter 3 we'll discuss elementary concepts of quantum mechanics and so we'll start out at the beginning with the particle wave duality uh, that means that electrons that we commonly think of little balls that move through a crystal, we, they can also behave like a light, waves, a light wave. And light waves can actually also behave like particles, and these particles are called photons. And so for at the example of an electron as wave, when you shoot an electron from an electron gun through a, a double slit aperture, then what you get here is actually a diffraction pattern which you usually would expect from light. So this experiment here uh, 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 that shows that electrons can actually behave like uh, electromagnetic waves. And then we have another experiment here very important, the photoelectric effect. And the photoelectric effect demonstrates that light waves can actually behave like particles. So these are two very important experiments that we will discuss at the beginning of chapter 3. Then we segue into the infinite potential well, which is sort of the only thing one can easily calculate analytically in quantum mechanics. And so here we will discuss the concept of confining uh, particles into a small space and then we will learn that their energy levels are discrete as soon as we confine them. We will also calculate the so-called wave functions that come out of the Schrödinger equation, a differential equation. So these wave functions here, they uh, can be calculated with this equation and for the infinite potential well we'll get simple sine uh, functions. And these sine functions actually tell us where to find the particles most likely. So basically where we have a belly, we will also find the particles, and where we have a node, there are no particles ever. And so this Schrodinger equation basically gives us these energy levels, and it also tells us where we find the particles most likely. So this is part of uh, chapter 3. And then at the end, we go from this uh, one-dimensional uh, infinite potential well will go to the three-dimensional atom and will discuss the hydrogen atom. And there we will uh, see that these uh, wave functions in three dimensions then look much more exciting than just simple uh, sine waves. And we will also calculate these energy levels again of the hydrogen atom. And so here we will see, because the potential is not infinite anymore, we will see that these energy levels get ever closer spaced uh, until um, above a certain level, the electron is free and then it can have any energy level it wants. So all this will be discussed in uh, chapter 3. In the end, we'll uh, discuss a little bit a simple molecule, so putting two of these um, atoms together. So we'll look at, at helium, and we'll learn about bonding and anti-bonding states, and then we'll also discuss the uh, laser at the end that depends on having these discrete electronic states. So now in, in chapter 4, we'll put a bunch of atoms together and form solids, and so we'll look at the quantum theory of solids. And what happens there is when we put uh, atoms together, we get more of these discrete states and small molecules here, the one, a very small one, the hydrogen molecule, will just get a bonding and an anti-bonding state out of these two um, valence states of the individual hydrogen atoms. And the electrons here go on the lower energy level, of course, because nature is inherently lazy. And so if one can lower one's energy, one does it. And this difference here is the bonding energy. And this is why the hydrogen uh, actually sticks together, these, these two atoms. But anyway, so two states from the uh, individual atoms make two molecular states. And so if you put more uh, atoms together, you get more of these molecular states. And uh, large molecules then give you even more of these states. And you see here already the idea, each atom contributes one of these states, and so this here depends on the number of atoms that we put together. 
and if we make a solid that has a gazillion of atoms in it then the spacing between these states gets really really small and we get something that's called a band and so one can think of this here as a continuum of energy levels that the electrons can uh, inhabit and so from this here then we'll start discussing how um, insulators and semiconductors come about right because when we put many atoms together we'll get here these anti-bonding orbitals and these bonding orbitals and they start overlapping more and more and so it turns out that some atoms actually create conduction band and valence bands that are separate from each other in a metal they overlap right so these are derived from the anti-bonding states these are from the bonding states so in a metal they overlap so we get just one band that's a that's a metal and then if we have these bands separated where all the electrons are down here in the valence band and none of the electrons are up in the conduction band we have this energy gap between those two bunches of states these two bands and that here now defines a semiconductor and if this gap gets really big then we have an insulator why is that well, if the gap is small, thermal excitation, a little bit of thermal energy in the electrons can put a few up here into the conduction band and then we get some metal-like uh, band here and then we get conductivity. If the gap is large, the electrons don't make it up there, thermally excited, and so the thing remains um, insulating. Then we'll uh, discuss the work function. The work function is essentially the energy that's required to move an uh, electron from the Fermi energy, that's another big topic of this chapter, from the Fermi energy up into the vacuum where it's free. So that's the work function. Who knows why it's called work function. Once we understand the work function, we go on to the contact potential and that's basically the voltage between two materials with different work functions and this we can utilize with the Seebeck effect to make thermocouples and uh, after that uh, at the end of chapter 4 we'll also discuss thermionic and field emission that's about how we can get electrons here from the Fermi level into the vacuum efficiently by uh, heating an electrode or by uh, applying a voltage to it so these are these two uh, methods here to extract electrons and this here of course then gives us um, electron beams for cathode ray tubes and electron microscopes. So this concludes chapter 4 and chapter 5 then we'll talk mostly about the uh, semiconductors. Alright and here we are in chapter 5. So here we will discuss semiconductors in a little bit more depth and the basic concept starts out with intrinsic semiconductors semiconductors that are essentially a pure slab of material as pure as we can make them and so in such semiconductors the Fermi energy is in the center the electrons up here in the conduction band are purely uh, coming from thermal excitation from the valence band and that causes some electrons go missing in the valence band which show up as positive charges these charges are commonly referred to as holes so we have basically positive and negative charge carriers in such semiconductors and when we apply a voltage across it then of course we get two currents one hole current and one electron current so in difference to metal we have to um, add these two currents in order to describe the current in a semiconductor so one topic of chapter 5 is to calculate how many electrons are up here and how many holes are down here. For this we start out by defining the density of states, G of E, and we'll see that the density of states is close to zero here at the uh, band edges and then gets larger as we go towards the uh, center of the bands. Um, here this can be approximated for simple semiconductors with a square root like, fu like function. Um, now this here gives us the states and then we also need some way to describe how many electrons do we have on these states and how many holes and for that we have the um, Fermi distribution which for electrons it's this one here that gives us the probability to find an electron on a certain state and of course that's close to one here um, in the valence band because this is predominantly full with electrons and up here we only have a few electrons thermally excited and so that's why the, the function here is pretty close to uh, zero.
we have another uh, function here for holes and of course that's one minus the distribution for electrons because each uh, hole down here has a corresponding electron up here. So if we multiply these two curves we get the actual distribution of electrons across these states here. So this is a very important part of chapter 5 and now once we understand the intrinsic semiconductors we can talk about doping and doping uh, occurs by uh, introducing atoms into the lattice and so this is here shown for silicon because it's such an interesting uh, and important material. If we put arsenic into silicon then there is one electron too many uh, on each of these arsenic atoms which are uh, bonded into the silicon lattice where each silicon is surrounded by four silicon atoms. So if we put an arsenic in there then there is one electron too many because arsenic has five valence electrons and this one electron then can be injected into the crystal lattice and create more electrons up here. And what this uh, causes is that the Fermi level moves closer to the uh, conduction band. Uh, we can do a similar thing for holes by introducing boron. Uh, boron has only three electrons and so that introduces holes into the crystal. So with, with this kind of uh, uh, impurities here we can actually tune the number of electrons and holes that we have in these bands in the semiconductor and that allows us to set a baseline for the uh, conductivity of a particular piece of uh, silicon or this works also for other semiconductor materials just with different atoms. So this is doping, that's a very important part and then once we understand all this we'll talk about the uh, temperature dependence of the conductivity in semiconductors and so we see that it behaves opposite to metals and that it also looks a little bit more complicated because of all these processes that we have here um, with um, thermal generation and doping and all of this. Further down in the chapter we'll uh, then also cover uh, optical phenomena and so we'll look here at optical absorption spectra in semiconductors and so we'll see that this band gap here uh, very much determines what kind of light can be absorbed by semiconductors. And that pretty much concludes chapter 5 and with that we are then also at the end of the uh, semester. And this concludes the introduction to the electronic materials course. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it.